So what are the top 100 plants? We'll see that the top 100 plants are the plants that do the best job of feeding wildlife. The top 100 plants are native plants, but not all native plants are created equal. And the top 100s are those that have been scientifically determined to be the best support for uh, our local wildlife. top 100 plants are, are the plants that feed wildlife and we'll talk about the food chain and how that works. We'll talk about herbivores and carnivores but there are different types of herbivores and how they all work together but the top 100 plants are those that are the foundation of all that especially the connection between plants and leaf eating insects are really a, an important class. The, the top 100 list exists because of the connection between native plants and wildlife. But how do the top 100 plants feed wildlife? Well, uh, it starts with the food chain and leaf eating insects are an important part of the food chain. Not all insects eat leaves. Not all herbivorous insects eat leaves. But plants don't want their leaves to be eaten and that's why it takes many, many thousands of years or uh, in some cases millions of years, for leaf-eating insects to be able to evolve to where they can get past the defenses that plants put in their leaves so that they won't be eaten. And the top 100 plants are those native plants that existed prior to European settlement. We've changed the landscape a lot in the last 500 years, and what we've mainly done is we've cleared the landscape of the plants that best support wildlife. But even with all the development that we have, even with all the many people that we have, we have the ability to reverse the decline of wildlife by placing in our home landscapes and in our parks and our college campuses and on our corporate campuses, we have the option of placing the plants that best support wildlife because for all of human history, what we've been doing is pushing wildlife out, and now there's no place left for wildlife to go. So if wildlife is to survive, we need to invite them in, bees, butterflies, and birds, and others, in to where we live, work, and play. And that is important not just for wildlife, but also for human survival, because we depend on wildlife, we depend on ecosystems, we depend on food chains, we depend on all the plants and the wild animals, because they all provide valuable services for us. For instance, trees are, are a good example. Trees cool the air, trees clean the air, trees absorb uh, some of the rainfall and keep our dirty, polluted water from going uh, at such volume into the waterways. So the, the best plants, the top 100 plants, provide valuable services for us, and we'll talk about that. Now, just to give you some examples, this is for my geographic area, which is Louisville, Kentucky. The top five, now each one of these is a genus. A genus is a group of species, and the plural of genus is genera. So these are the top five genera, the top five groups of species, that are in the top 100. So starting with oak trees, uh, oak trees and then native plums and cherry trees. There are non-native cherry trees. We need to make sure we choose the native ones. Native Number three, native willow trees. There are non-native willows and we need to make sure we choose the natives. Birch trees, native maple trees. So we'll see this list again a little bit later, but I wanted to show you some examples of what I mean when I talk about the top 100 plants, these being the top five. So let's talk about food chains. So food chains, really the basis of the food chain and the critical link that has been neglected uh, in all of our busyness uh, has been the link between plants and leaf-eating insects. Now there are herbivores, there are herbivorous insects that are not leaf eaters. Pollinators, for example, eat the blooms, and there are many insects and birds and so forth that eat the fruit, such as the berries and cherries and apples. Uh, so they're herbivorous, but they're not the leaf-eating insects. So leaf-eating insects are the very basis of the food chain, and everything else depends on those. Uh, everything else depends on insects. Uh, 
E.O. Wilson, the famous Harvard biologist and best-selling author, said a world without biological diversity is a world without humans, and insects are, he said, insects are the little things that run the world. So when we're talking about uh, food chains, insects are the little things that run the food chains, and the leaf-eating insects are the ones that we focus on when we talk about the top 100 plants because the top 100 plants are those that feed the leaf-eating insects on which everything else depends. Herbivorous insects are specialized and I thought about putting a question mark on that because are all herbivorous insects specialized? Pollinators have some degree, and when I say specialized, I mean they're focused on a particular food source, one or a small number of food sources. So they're specialized with respect to their food source. So pollinators, are they specialized? Well, to some extent they are because not all pollinators can pollinate all plants. But plants want their blooms to be eaten. Therefore, uh, there's not uh, as much specialization with respect to pollinators as there is to leaf-eating insects. However, herbivores, uh, there is some degree of specialization, but leaf eaters are the most specialized out of that group. Okay, so leaf-eating insects are very specialized. That includes, you know, oaks have, the oak trees have only a small set of insects that can eat their leaves because the leaves are loaded with toxins. Trees don't want their leaves to be eaten because that's how they get their energy. They get their energy from the sun through a process called photosynthesis, and they don't want their leaves to be eaten. If a tree or a plant were to have all of its leaves eaten, then it would die and there wouldn't be, you know, so it would die. So they want to prevent that. So they load their leaves with chemicals that prevent most of us from eating, uh, fr from eating leaves. So go out and grab a leaf at random and try to eat it. It's going to taste bitter because it has those toxins in it. Some are in fact poisonous because uh, the cyanide, for example, is the poison that's found in cherries. And uh, nicotine is the, uh, is the toxic chemical that is found in tomatoes and uh, tobacco. So leaf-eating insects are very specialized because it takes them eons to be able to evolve and through the process of natural selection, it takes a long, long, very long time for them to get past the defenses that are in uh, the leaves. So you have a tobacco hornworm is focused on tomato leaves and tobacco leaves. And um, uh, cherry trees are among their, the cyanide is toxic, but they are very good at supporting a rather small group, but cherries are, uh, are number two on the list of the top 100 because, uh, because they support a lot of species, but still it's very specialized. I mean, this, each species is specialized on that particular genus. So plants don't want, to be their, want their leaves to be eaten. We've talked about that, and that's why it's important for us to have a good representation of all of the top 100 in our landscape our homes, our uh, campuses, our corporate and, and college campuses, our parks need to have a good representation of this top 100 because of the specialization. You need a diversity and abundance of these, a diversity and abundance of these native plants so that there is in turn a diversity and abundant, an abundance of all of the, uh, the leaf-eating insects that eat them most of which are entirely harmless to people, by the way. Uh, so why are we talking about all this? Wildlife is declining, declining rapidly and, disturb and disturbingly in some cases at disturbing rates. So let's talk about two examples. Let's talk about birds and let's talk about the monarch butterfly. In North America, there are 900 species, approximately nine, well, 914 species of birds. Uh, in 2014, the State of the Birds report said that 230 of those are imperiled. But only two years later, 430 of the 900 species of American birds are imperiled. 
Now, this is just not just idle gossip. This is not some professor sitting in an ivory tower speculating. This is based on good data because so many people like birds. You have bird watching clubs go out and they see birds and they record their data. They hear birds and they record the data and feed the data into databases. So we have a lot of good information about, uh, about birds. So when we say birds are in trouble, and if you go, uh, you know, if you look around, there are, there are birds out there, but they're a lot of the same birds, the starlings, the sparrows, the pigeons, the crows, the blue jays, the cardinals. There's not much variety of birds. So birds are in trouble, declining rapidly. The solution to that is the top 100 plants. And then we'll talk a little bit about how, the steps that you can take a little bit later. Another example, the monarch butterfly. Monarch butterfly is down by 95% in the last 20 years. Now we know this because at least in the east, at least east of the Rocky Mountains, the monarch butterflies fly south every winter. They overwinter in a region of Mexico and they, the a rather small region actually, a few square miles. And scientists have been observing this overwintering uh, population for you know 40 years or more and it's the only butterfly that congregates in such large numbers in such a localized area so we can very much estimate the number just by looking at the acreage so the acreage that they occupy in Mexico has been declining rapidly and the it's estimated that the monarch butterfly, the most famous insect in the world, has declined by 95% in 20 years. So those are just two indicators of wildlife that's declining, and, but they're, they're only the species that are most easily counted. Uh, it says nothing about the species that are harder to count. Most butterflies are harder to count than the, um, than, than the monarch butterfly. Most other vertebrates, uh, you know, birds are one class, uh, one of the five classes of vertebrates. Most vertebrates are harder to count. So these are only the examples on which we have hard data. So wildlife is declining, but I like to say it's a serious problem with a beautiful solution. The beautiful solution has to do with reinstating, reinstalling the native plants that were here uh, before European settlement. And we can do this in our yards. We can do this in our parks. The only reason it hasn't been, been done is a, you know, a, a huge lack of awareness, but we are becoming more aware and we can spread the word and we can get this done. Wildlife is declining. It's a serious problem with a beautiful solution. So we should pay attention to local extinction, not just global extinction. Uh, if, if the, uh, if, let's take the eastern swallowtail butterfly, which you know you see a few of them still, but if it's not, if it doesn't exist in your neck of the woods, then it then it doesn't then it's extinct. It's locally extinct. So the only way global extinction occurs, you know, in in the press, in the media, in textbooks, etc., the focus has always been on global extinction. You know, when are the populations of this or that species going to get so low that they're globally extinct? Well, the only way that happens is for them first to become locally extinct. So acre by acre, square mile by square mile, we have cleared all the native species, that is the top 100 species. We've cleared all the native species on which wildlife depends. And if acre by acre, square mile by square mile, there is local extinction, then it ultimately results in global extinction. But each species provides valuable services in our, on our acre or on our square mile. They provide valuable services in that, for example, many, I mean, you know, birds almost exclusively depend on caterpillars, uh, not almost, most birds depend on caterpillar. Most North American terrestrial birds uh, depend on caterpillars in order to raise their young. It's kind of a myth that all birds need is berries and seeds. They eat berries and seeds in the summer and the fall, but in the spring when they're reproducing, they need caterpillars, and the ones that don't eat caterpillars eat other insects. 96% of terrestrial birds in North America eat insects when they're reproducing. Without the insects, there are no, you know, the birds continue to decline, to decline as they have been, and without the top 100 uh, trees 
and plants, they, the, um, the, the, that, that's what depletes our supply of insects, most of which are completely harmless to humans. We need to re-engineer our food chains. And the idea here is that the idea here is that, you know, we tend to think nature is out there and nature is happy out there. And that we just need to take a passive approach and we just need to leave nature alone. But nature has not been left alone. We have imp imported plant species into this country. We have imported 3,300 plant species yeah, we've imported a lot more than that, but 3,300 is just the number that are running rampant as invasive species in our natural areas, in our wildlife preserves, in our, in our woodlands. So we need to be on top of this in that we need to be proactive at helping our natural areas uh, and our woodlands be, um, be friendly to wildlife. So it's not just about, we can't just take a passive approach. We can't just leave nature alone because we have not left nature alone. And I'll share with you how we can do that. The top 100 plants are the best plants for North American food chains. So the top 100 plants is different potentially in every county of the United States. It's probably very similar from one county to the next, but you don't have to go very far until the top 100 becomes a little different list than it was. Uh, I live in Louisville, Kentucky. The top 100 plants that I refer to most often are the ones that are specific to my area of Louisville, Kentucky. All I had to do was go to a particular website that uh, sponsored by the National Wildlife Federation, type in my zip code, and I get a list of what are the best plants for, uh, for my particular locality. So the top 100 plants are the best plants for, for your locality because they do the best job of supporting the leaf-eating insects on which everything else depends. And only within the last two years can you and I go to a website and get that information so that we can be informed. Because as we'll see in a minute, not all plants are created equal. Some plants are very good, some plants are very bad, and there's everything in the middle. We see plants all around us but not all plants are created equal. Look out your window, you see green. Whether you're at home, at work, or you're driving down the highway, you see green everywhere, but not all plants are equal. Much of the green that you see when you're driving down the highway is invasive species. In my area of Louisville, Kentucky, you look out and you see bush honeysuckle everywhere. And bush honeysuckle is, it's killing trees in the cradle because it does not allow our native trees to grow. You can look, you know, it, it, it's, it's everywhere. When you start to identify it, you start to see it everywhere. And uh, so if you look at, out at a group of trees in the late spring and in the, excuse me, in the early spring and in the late fall is a good time in my area to look out and see all the bush honeysuckle underneath the trees. It gets up to about 10, 12 feet and everything you see below 10 or 12 feet is invasive species and they're bad. Not all plants are equal. The top 100 uh, plants are the best plants and the invasive species are the worst. So we need to be aware of that and take action appropriately and I will show you how to take action uh, later on in this presentation. So the top 100 plants are the ones that will solve the decline of wildlife. They will solve the decline of wildlife. So, but we have to take action. We have to know what the top 100 plants are. We need to know that the, the be able to identify the relatively few species of uh, that are invasive and are posing a threat to the top 100 plants. Uh, but it, they will solve our uh, the the decline of wildlife problem because the decline of wildlife is all about the food chain. The food chain starts with leaf-eating insects, and the top 100 plants are those plants that feed the leaf-eating insects in your geographic area. So what's the next step? Let's talk about action and awareness. So the steps basically are awareness and action. Become aware and then take action. Awareness is being aware of what the good plants are. 
And the top100plants.com exists to tell you what the good plants are. And uh, it's information that should be widely available already, but it has not been. That's why this website exists. Find out what the good plants are, and at the end I will give you an email address that you can use to find out uh, how to take your next step in becoming aware of what the good plants are. Also become aware of what the bad plants are, and although there are hundreds, probably there are thousands of invasive species, in any given geographic area there are about a dozen of them that are the worst. So if you uh, learn how to identify those dozen or so invasive species, then then, you, then that's the the awareness that you need uh, and the, some awareness about how to remove them. Uh, taking action uh, means planting the good plants and get re getting rid of the bad plants. Planting the good plants is sometimes all you need to do because if you're just if you're just taking a lawn and replacing it with good plants, then you don't have to deal with the bad plants very much. But if you're dealing with a woodlands area, you're going to have to, you know, uh, you know, as a society, we need to dedicate more volunteers for one. I supervise groups of volunteers that are out every weekend uh, removing invasive species, getting rid of those bad plants in our parks. And if you volunteer for groups like that, then you will learn what they look like. You'll start to see them everywhere. You will probably see them in your own fence row or hedge row because in my area, there, where any place that is not mowed, any place that is not mowed is overrun with bad plants. And usually it's where you have trees that are allowed to grow up and even the trees won't be there. Uh, before too long, you know, in a, in a generation or two, the trees are going to be gone because the bad plants don't let the seeds grow, they don't let the seedlings grow, they don't let the saplings grow. So taking a action means getting rid of the bad plants. So awareness and action are the two keys. You've seen this before, but the, these are the top five genuses or genera in my geographic area. You have oak trees, you have native plum and cherry trees. Uh, you have native willow trees, make sure they're natives, not the weeping willow or the Japanese willow. You have birch trees, which um, are the host plant or the food plant for, for example, the river birch dagger moth is, uh, is allowed to exist only because of the uh, existence of birch trees. And native maple trees, make sure they're native. A Norway maple is not native. In fact, it's very invasive. In my area, you can use sugar maple or water maple. There are other types of maples, but make sure they're native. They're also wonderful shade trees. So the steps to saving, saving our wildlife. We talked about steps a couple of slides ago, but this is kind of a different, this is more the action part of those steps. So start with a place. You know, if you're a homeowner, you can start with your home. If you're a community leader, you can start with a local park. But start with a place and get permission. Uh, you need to get permission to get in there and you, know, you can't just randomly go in and start cutting because somebody owns that, somebody manages that, and they need to know what you're doing. So start with a place and get permission. Number three, identify the plants. Now, if you're not great with identifying plants, that's okay because uh, in the age of the internet, uh, it's easy to find out the, ident the identity of plants. So there are a couple of really, there's some really good groups on Facebook. One is called Plant Identification. One is called Plant Ident 101. So step number three, if you don't know how to identify plants, if you, there are not very many plants that you know, then you can upload uh, you can take a picture with your cell phone, upload that to Facebook, and be able to identify plants. Step four, we've talked a lot about already, but remove the bad plants. Um, sometimes this involves herbicide, but that you know requires some licensing and some careful use. It, don't get hung up on the issue of herbicide. Cut the bad plants. They're going. Some people will tell you, oh, don't you got to use herbicide for that because they're going to come back. Yeah, well, they're going to come back anyway that we have to weed the woods, we have to weed, you know, it's, it's weeding. You wouldn't expect to weed a garden once and have the weeds all gone. It's an ongoing process, but remove the bad plants. Uh, learn how to identify them and then cut them. Even if they come back, it's better to cut them because that prevents them from spreading.
Number five, plant the good plants. That's what the, you know, the good plants, that's what the top 100 list is all about. So plant the good plants. Um, and that, that's, uh, you know, that the top 100 exists to help you uh, determine what the good plants are and how to take steps in the right direction. Number six, repeat as needed. The work is never done, but it's fun work, it's healthy work, and it's, uh, and I, I assure you, it's healthy work, and it's healthy for our forests because the only forests today that are healthy are those that are cared for, and there are not very many forests that are cared for. So expect it to be ongoing work, expect but it's healthy. It's, you know, get out on Saturday morning and skip the gym because it's good exercise. So to find out more, visit top100plants.com or email me at info at top100plants.com. Thank you very much.